Hey brother Hear me now Brother dog Know me Understand Welcome to the Sargasset Podcast. I'm Robbie Thigpen. I'm Francesca Elmer. And I am Mar Fernandez. And we are your hosts for today. And we are going to share with you the latest ideas and concepts about sargassum and sargassum beaching events, which have become an international challenge. What's happening, everybody? Anybody do anything interesting this week? I mean, same, same as always. Um, checking the beaches of Playa del Carmen, sargassum arriving almost every day, and working during the day on the podcast and other things. How about you, Clea? Wow, really nice. Well, I wish I would. I was looking at uh, some sargassum uh, arriving on the beach, but actually, I am still in Paris, looking at the sun shining because we have beautiful days. So, I'm actually good. Nice, nice. I, I, uh, I've had a kind of an interesting morning. Uh, I've gotten to talk about Mendazi, Ugali, and Sukumawiki, and um, smile with a new friend. And uh, that's been pretty exciting to me. I always like making new friends, especially when they're from someplace else. And that leads us up. This is, we're, we're talking to Jerry Manana today. He's a marine biologist and aquapreneur, co-founder and director of Aquaforms organization in Tanzania, in East Africa, and he's a tutor at the School of Aquatic Sciences and Fisheries Technology at the University of Dar es Salaam, and uh, co-organizer of TEDx Oyster Bay, uh, a Mandela Washington fellow, a global shaper in climate reality. This guy just does a lot of stuff, and there's this long list of accomplishments he's made, and and I, you know, this is about, there's about another half a paragraph of great things this guy's done. And all, and we're just really proud to have him here today. And what I like about him, he's really committed to, to taking care of these ecosystems and all, and, and taking these some of these bad situations that have are a result of anthropogenic climate change, and make the best of them. I'm just really excited to have him here today. Tafadali Rafiki, habaya wele. Zuri sana, zuri sana, ole. Excellent, excellent. Jerry, nice to have you here. And you're our first guest from um, Africa, actually, because we haven't managed yet to talk to people in East Africa about sargassum. But now we're actually talking to somebody in West Africa about sargassum, where most people don't even know that sargassum is a thing. So I want to ask you, what is sargassum to you? Sargassum to me, thank you. Thank you everyone um, for having me here today and um, I'm pleased to be part of this podcast and I'm happy to share what um, Sagasam is to me. So um, Sagasam to me, I think it's an opportunity in that case, apart from how it's been seen in different parts of the world. Um, I've, I've read and you know seen videos and documentaries about the way um, Sagasam is a problem in different places. But then in my perspective, I think Sagasam is an opportunity that, you know, it can turn lives of people, but also an opportunity to learn more about the changing, you know, oceans and, and the changing world. Yes, really interesting. Thank you for being in the podcast. Actually, we, we are not really aware of what is happening in Africa and even less in Eastern Africa. So we are really curious to have you here today. And uh, could you tell us more about uh, when has sargassum started to arrive in Zanzibar, the story of uh, sargassum in your place? Yeah, sure. So in the seaweed or, or the algae story of, of Tanzania, it started back in the in the 1980s, where Professor Mshigeni, one of the experts in botany, started studying the sargassum and different other, other, other algae in the country. But then the efforts were all merged into, into one thing, which is the commercialized species of um, spinosum and cotony, which are, you know, the currently uh, algae that are, you know, farmed and harvested for commercial purposes. And since then, there was very little research going into, into, into Sagasam. And then as I was 
trying to read and understand and you know refer to what's available in the literature, I, I realized that you know there are almost no research done or you know more or less no information around sargassum and is I, I call this a, a blindness around sargassum. And why why am I thinking so? Because sargassum has been in the waters of Zanzibar and Tanzania for for years and they have been washed to the coast depending on the seasons. So in Tanzania or Zanzibar, we do have um, the monsoon winds, we have the northeast monsoon winds and the southeast monsoon winds, which influence the fishery and influence the ecosystems of the of the ocean now and then. So there is actually no information on you know what are the volumes of sagasam coming in you know in Zanzibar or the mainland of Tanzania even to the extent of, you know, what are the diversity of species that are, you know, coming in this, in this area. There's just um, a few information to my knowledge today from a book that is speaking of the Western Indian Ocean in general, but nothing specifically for Zanzibar or, or Tanzania. And I've been asking even the local communities who are living along the coast, fishermen, seed farmers, and people doing tourism in the coast, you know what? What have what have they been seeing around um, Sagasam, and when do they think it started coming? And they say that you know it has been there since they were very young, when they started noticing things, and until today, it's it's still there, but just a difference in in volumes. It's what they think of. So you're talking about difference of volume. So how much Sagasam arrives, and um, does it? arrives uh, more massively these last years or uh, is it the same average more or less yeah so so when i i had an opportunity to um speak at, at this podcast i you know went a step ahead just to create a baseline information that i thought it will create you know and give me confidence in what i'm going to speak today and i try to speak to a number of people who i work with um along the coast of zanzibar Um, and, you know, people who are seaweed farmers, you know, they visit the ocean almost every day, uh, fishermen and people who are doing coastal tourism. And I just asked them the same question, you know, what did they think 10 years back and now? And I talked to 10 people out of 10, seven said that um, they think there's more sagasam now than even before. So perhaps it's the changing environment Um, but yet the effects of, of Sagasam are, are to be seen to that extent as the way it's being seen in the Caribbean. But I think it's time to you know, start looking at it so that we can be prepared in case there are any massive blasts that will come in the near future. Excellent. Excellent. Tafa Dali Rafiki. Um, you're working with 58 women in Zanzibar, you know, with... Uh, training financial literacy and, and business management skills and added value to these seaweed products that you're producing. And I yeah. imagine you're working with a, a bunch of other groups as well. And I'll, um, you know, I have friends in Lamu, Ghazi Bay, in, in Kenya, uh, Melindi, mm. uh, you know, a lot, lot of, lot of coast friends. And, and you, you yourself speak Swahili, which means the language of the man of the coast. So how many different groups are you working with, different tribes are you working with? And how does does the sargassum in itself affect these people, these different groups along the coast? Yeah, sure. Um, I would like to categorize the, the groups based on what exactly they do, because Tanzania, I think, if you compare to any other African country, is one of the countries that um, try, we have a total of uh, more than 100 tribes in the country, and we're all speaking one language, which is Swahili, and that has united um, and following the, you know, intermarriages between tribes right now it's very difficult even to say what my tribe is so we just usually to pick the dad's um, tribe but um, in actual, yeah in actual sense um, <clears throat> it's difficult to tell what tribes exactly because people mm -hmm. are moving around and and in that case but I will categorize them in terms of what exactly they do so the key players of our coast are you know people in, in the fishing industry which are you know artisan fishermen who are using small uh, canoes, um, who are using small engine boats to do fishing along the coast. And then we do have people who are doing seaweed farming, which is the spinosum and cottony farming, and people who are doing coastal tourism, you know, taking people to dolphin tours, you know, diving in the corals and stuff like that. When I, I asked them around um, what is the effect 
um, you know, in, in their, in, in the, in, to their works on every day, it was this way. Starting with the fishermen, um, the fishermen, um, they say that like, so the different seasons were the different volumes of, of sagasum. And when it's the, it's the season, when they put their nets for capturing fish, they find it, you know, clogged with, with, with sagasum. And then they have to tend the net and then bring it up and then starting to remove one piece after the other, which it takes them days. And in that, in that way, they don't make money in the few days that they have to clean it up. It has happened even some that have decided to discard the nets because it's too much energy and, 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 and level force that is needed to clean it up from the clogged um, sagasum. But then I just asked them around also, how do they, you know, tackle that? And one among the things they do is if it's the season, they try as much as possible to avoid places with those. But we all know that sagasum usually floats on the top surface. So what they do is just increase more heavy uh, bottom line of the net so that the, the net will not be floating on the top and reduce the number of, of floating buoys. And then it becomes a little bit at least one meter below this, the, the surface. And that way, you know, it, the, 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 there's not a lot of sagasum that will be stuck into the, into the net, which um, I thought it's, it's a creative way of addressing the, the problem. But one way or the other, perhaps it's reducing their catch, but it's something that needs more research. The, the second group that I, I spoke with are the seaweed farmers. Um, so in Tanzania, we're using off-bottom pegs. So they're placing pegs on the bottom and then putting ropes and then tying the seed of the spinosum and or cotoni on the along the rope. And then we usually tie it with plastic bottles to make it as, as floated. So that's a typical local seaweed farm that doesn't use your know, industrial made boys. So they recycle plastic bottles and tie them and use them as floaters. So what happens is that um, when sagasum comes in, it usually, you know, gets into the, into the farms. And then in this way, it just increases their work. They need to, you know, clean the, the seaweed every now and then where they go to look at it. So usually during the spring tide is where they visit their farms and, and look at it because they do not have, you know, vessels. And a lot of people who are working in the seaweed industry in Tanzania more than 80% are women, making it um, difficult for them because they do not have swimming skills and there's, they have to go during the spring tide. So when they go there, they use a lot of time to clean different epiphytes and other organisms that are, you know, in the seaweed, but one among it, it's, it's, it's sagasum. So the problem with sagasum is that when it stacks on the rope, it increases the weight that was estimated by the farmer. And then at the end of the day, that peg may, you know, clip off or, and then they lose their, their crop. But in the number of farmers that I've spoken with, they, they are also addressing that by, you know, either avoiding to put the boys so that the seaweed will just be laying down and the sagasum can pass up. And that way it reduces the possibilities of it being stuck in the farms. But, um, you know, you go to any farm today, you would find a lot of sagasum that are stuck in the, in the seaweed farms there. And then the other community that I spoke with um, is the, you know, local tourist agents who are, you know, taking tourists to the dolphin tours and other places where they could, you know, enjoy the ocean. It's, it's usually a bad season for them, actually, because um, usually Sagasam is associated with a lot of jellyfish and no tourist would want to go into a water that is sure that there's jellyfish, that's one. But, but secondly, also, you, you go into the corals, sometimes you find a lot of sagasum. There's a place called Matemu. Uh, there's a good coral there, but then sometimes it's being um, covered up with sagasum and there's not so much to view or see um, in terms of tourism and you know the attraction of the corals that what that's what people actually usually follow when they go to you know diving or snorkeling. When I ask them how do you address this and you know they say it what can we do? You know, we just have to accept that and, you know, just try to look for different sites, but then you find the sites where you want to go, there's no dolphins and, and that way, nothing you can get there. I, I saw a video on YouTube that, you know, people are even using machines to pull off sagasum from, from the ocean. And, you know, I, I just imagine if that happens once in, in, in the coast of Tanzania or Zanzibar, what will it be? I, I think there will be a lot of 
of problems because we do we do not have those machineries and it's gonna take time for them to be here as well. I can just not imagine. You know, my 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 motive right now is to you know understand further the problem and you know understand what are the issues around that we could be ready for so that when it happens, then at least we are prepared. And I'll I'll use my organization, uh, my business, as well as my connections with the government to, you know, make them aware that, you know, this, if it's not coming now, then it's going to come soon. So we got to be prepared. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Let me, let me follow up with something there. I, I uh, some of the reefs, you know, you, you talk about the reefs and tourism and, and the yeah. fisheries. So I, I got a multi-pronged question. One is I'm interested in what kind of uh, marine species, whether fish or otherwise, that are being targeted for the most part, either with nets or hook and line or spearing or whatever. And I'm also interested in the, in the condition. This is a question for, for Francisca more than it is for me. I'm not gonna name specific places, but there's some some reefs in Kenya that are beat to death. They There's hardly any life there. They're covered in algae and all. What are the conditions of the reef in the mainland of Tanzania and on Zanzibar? All right, great. Um, starting with the, with the first question, which was around what is, so, you know, our waters are tropical, so tropical waters has a diversity of species that, you know, people are targeting, and the size of your boat is the first thing that determines what type of fish you're aiming at, and then, you know, do you have an engine? That's the second thing that determines what species can you go for, and then your locality also determines what can you go for, but then um, we have, like, People who are using canoes are usually fishing just very close to the reef and they get a lot of, you know, reef fishes. And then we have people who are uh, going into boats. They are small boats that they take you up to 40, 50 people. And these are the ones that are targeting tuna and tuna-like species, which are not far off the coast, but just, you know, it's it's within still the, the, the 12 nautical miles that are the territorial waters and you know, there are no vessels of local people that can go far to the east. And so in that case, we're, we're, we're wandering around, around that. But also there's anchovies or sardines. That's one of the very important fishery here in Tanzania. Um, it's, it's contributing to a lot of feeds for people, but also it's being used as well towards Central Africa as well, in DRC, Congo and neighboring countries as well. So that's, that's in terms of, of species. Are the people there uh, exploiting dugongs, sea turtles, turtle eggs, and stuff like that as well. Oh, yeah. So um, the good thing is that, you know, Tanzania, as much as, you know, we really want to enjoy our resources, we are also upfront in protecting the resources. And dugongs, sea turtles, those are, you know, highly illegal to fish them. And even if you get them as a biker, you have to help them um, from the nets. That's one, but also there's a lot of campaigns around, you know, educating people, uh, you know, why they shouldn't eat sea turtles, why they shouldn't eat dugons, and and that way, you know, the knowledge is is far way beyond. But also, you harvest it. Where will you take it? Because you know, there are landing sites where fishermen bring fish, and you know, no landing site will accept not just the dugons and dolphins or or, or, or sea turtles, but also illegal fished fish. You know, like, you know, in Tanzania back before 2019, there was a lot of dynamite fishing that was happening. And, you know, the government put a lot of effort to educate people, but also uh, enforcement. In that way, there was, you know, a, a decrease in, 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 you know, in dynamite fishing, which has actually helped that. But also in different places, people are already practicing, you know, temple closures. You know, there's a place in, in, in Songo Songo down the south of Tanzania where they do um, octopus closures, where they, you know, as a community, they have, they have agreed. And what they do is they close the, 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 the reef for four months. And then after that, they open it for one month where they do a fishing of the octopus. And then they close it again in the next four months. And, you know, that has turned the economy of that village into, into something different. They are harvesting, you know, people, they see the value of fishery now. And you know, everyone is telling someone else, you do not have to go to that reef because we have closed it now and we are waiting for our harvesting time. So it's giving the, the ecosystem time enough to, to revive. But 
if you've read about marine parks in Tanzania, is, is one of the countries that has you know numerous marine reserve areas. Just off the coast of Dar es Salaam here, we have almost four or five marine reserve areas and more than 20 marine reserve areas along the coast of Tanzania. In this in different places and you know it's nice because those areas are patrolled but also the community understands that these are marine reserve areas and we are not supposed to do one two three and you know they keep avoiding that so I, I can say the status for you know conservation in Tanzania is, is 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 really really in a good stage you know what we have to do is just to ensure that these communities that we are telling them this is how they should do it then we just ensure that their livelihood is still on support. So it's, if it's either bringing them alternative livelihood support, such as you know aquaculture practices, which is sustainable, or different approaches that go, then you know we, we're gonna be in, in a better situation, even from where we are right now. There's several places in Kenya where the the races have been beat to death. There's hardly any life in them. Covered in algae, they're they're dead. You know, and, and this was some years ago since I was I was there. But um, what what is the situation of the reefs in you know the mainland of Tanzania and and you know associated with those associated with Zanzibar as well? Yeah, about the reefs in in Tanzania. First of all, I would say like the status of the reef is is dated on you know researches that are done back the way since 2013, and all those researches were reflecting back to the El Nino rains that happened in in 1997 1998 and you know that el nino actually caused extensive loss of reefs in some places up to 80 percent of the reef cover was was damaged but then right now there are efforts to you know restore reefs and ensuring like this natural generation like my organization our farms organization has been throwing proposals to different places in in the world just to see if we could restore reefs of Dar es Salaam here icri they released a a, a book or a guideline of coral restoration that we're currently, you know, reading it around. But you know, as the way you've done on mangroves, I think it's very important for that book to go into different languages so many people can even understand and make use of it. Which in that case, it could be as easy as the way people are doing mangrove restoration now to restore the corals. That's that's what I I think. But there's still a lot to be done around restoration, and we we know if I can make it very clear, reefs usually transfer. Um, seeds from one reef to the other, and that's depending on the water current, as well as the the settlement environment in the where the the, the, the seeds are going. But then genetically, if these reefs are not um, connected somehow, they there's no way those seeds will just be dead seeds in, at the end. So it's it's really important to even understand the connectivity around the the reefs in, in the coast of Tanzania, so that we could know what reefs could help other reefs to, to restore and you know bring back the lives that the extensive dynamic fishing that has been happening back in the years to be replaced right now. Tapi Dali. <laughs> That's very interesting, for sure. Um, I actually did some work for my PhD with coral recruitment. So yes, the, the currents in there, which, wow. which, is a, which reef feeds another one is actually really Difficult question to answer, but very important one. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, you answer my question actually. It was about the if there is any management in place, mm -hmm. but you said no, because there is no big engine like boats uh, for the collection. But is there any uh, manual collection, like people getting on the beaches and taking the sargassum out of the land? There's a place called Kizimkaz, which is in the south of Zanzibar. They believe that if you remove sargassum from the coast, then erosion will be even faster and quicker. So like in that place, they have agreed that, you know, there's minimum um, collection, especially for only people who are wanting it for, you know, uses of medicine. They just wanted to let it be there, you know, it will add soil to our coast because there's a lot of erosion happening in that area and that's the way they they, they are happy for Sagas. That's the effort that, you know, it's it's done by the communities there. You know, they, they are retaining so that in one way or the other it, you know, will reduce erosion in that case. So I think it's a good it's a good act because you know Zanzibar is a small island and a lot of people have been harvesting sand from the coast. If people are thinking of, you know, how Sagasam could be reclaiming the cost, then that's a really good um, thing, yeah. You also said that 
next to using it to replenish the coast and the beaches that some people are using it for medicine. Are there any other things? Can you tell us a bit more about what type of medicine they're making and if there's any other ways they're using sargassum? Yeah, sure. So um, in, in Zanzibar and the pe coastal people, we call sargassum mtutu. That's the way we call it. And calling it that way, it's, it's related to chicken pox. So the coastal people, they call chicken pox mtutu, but in Swahili, it's the kuwanga. And a lot of kids, you know, in the, in the young age, they usually get chicken pox. And what, what's happening is that the women go and collect these um, and then they they boil it in hot water and then they wash the kids with with that warm water with you know sagasam or soft cream in and then you know that way they heal quicker from the from the chicken pox. That's the first way they saying it's really good for the skin. But I should warn you that once it, one thing is that they have like three or four diversities or of, of, of sagasam that is coming on the coast, but what species exactly um, we, we're not sure of yet. We need to do that and, and understand them clearly. But then what they do is, you know, they pick any and they apply it in that case. But, you know, it has been helping them and, you know, medicine, it's about belief. But another thing, you know, it, it might have some detox things that, you know, are helping kids to heal their skin issues as well. Nice. There's some uh, groups in the Caribbean that are making soaps, mm -hmm. sabuni. Yeah. and uh, lotions for the skin. So I, I think that you're, uh, the women there in, in Tanzania may, may be onto something very important. Definitely, yeah. And you, you tell them I said that. Tell them I, I thank them for their, for their uh, <laughs> ingenuity and all, please, and, and greet them for me. Yeah, I'll do that, yeah. Excellent. You, you had a tilapia grow-out project, yes? Yeah, yeah. So the reason I put aquaprina in my, in my, in my bio is because I believe I'm an aquatic investor like you know I, I i really believe in the sustainable utilization of aquatic resources i believe that you know, if the ocean is more than 70 percent and you know like tanzania has three great lakes and vast number of rivers then there's a potential that aqua entrepreneurship can be a solution to many of the issues around poverty zero hunger jobs creation and, and many other issues that are facing the the continent and, and the world as at large and in that case, uh, I have an investment in aquaculture, and it's called aqua, aqua Farms Hatcheries, which it's actually solving a problem around um, supply of tilapia fingerlings to farmers of, of Tanzania. And you know, the hatchery is actually giving fingerlings at fifty percent discount on the market price. That's one thing. Um, second thing, it's, you know, operating on a 100% recirculating system. That way it could be sustainable and not a problem to the environment. But also we are using native species of Tanzania that we have not imported from anywhere and, you know, developing them so that we could not spoil the, the, the genetic pool in, in Tanzania. So my, my dream or our dream with my partners in, in, in this is that, you know, we could have one of the best hatcheries in, in Tanzania that, you know, every farmer would think of when they're thinking of doing fish farming and we believe that aquaculture could be the chicken story like the way how every house you go in Africa has at least one two chickens then that way should everyone should have at least one two tilapia that they could fish on for for a festival or for dinner at one time in the in the life or, or, or by chance or, or you also using the water the plants to maybe clean the water and maybe grow vegetables at the same time with this kind of process or anything like that Oh yes, yes. So our, our system right now it's it's completely recirculating, but we are we are speaking to a company called Gropod in, in US. It's in, in in Indianapolis. And you know, these people have created a space where you could do the hydroponic system without using the general sunlight and stuff like that. And they are helping us to expand and systemize our project into sort of an aquaponic where we could also do veggies from, from that system as well. And Perhaps in the next few weeks, we'll be having our, our first harvest as well from, from that. And I'm excited to eat this because I think they'll be the best, you know, veggies that I've eaten because I know where they come from. I know they have been treated very well and very clean. That's, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Let me, let me move to the, let's go out to the wild, wild west of Tanzania real quick, uh, to yeah. Lake Victoria. Mm. You know, when I when I was out west, I, I got me some fresh tilapia, you know, right out of the right, right out of the water, man. Those, those 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 eat good. My favorite fish to eat 
when I was there was a Nile perch, some smoked mm -hmm. Nile perch. Oh, it, it's it's nice. I love it. And yeah. uh, it my, my, I, that might have been my favorite thing to eat there. It was a smoked fish. But as you know, since they built the dam at Bujigali Falls in Uganda, the now perch has been introduced into Lake Victoria and is causing some problems there. Yeah. Um, is there, by chance, is there anyone, those get to be a pretty big fish, is there anyone thinking about working with the Nile perch as a potential aquaculture species? Yeah, that's a tricky question. <laughs> the, the reason it was introduced there is because um, the lake was had a lot of aprochromines, which you know, are small spiny fish that you know had no any potential income for you know for the nation for the people, and that's why they introduced that so that one way is just to put the ecosystem in place, but also the other way to create an economic flow. But then um, things turned out in a different way um, later on, and then they had again to replace with some other Nile just to you know put the food food web more or less stabilized. And then right now, the more or less we can say, you know, we are used to what's happening in the lake. But then, you know, Nile perch is a carnivore fish. I, I can think even beyond tuna, which is currently people are trying to, you know, do aquaculture. I have not heard or seen any efforts of people trying to do Nile perch in captivity. But, you know, I think if people have money, it's something worth trying because, you know, it, it has good value in the UK and in the Western world, yeah. Yeah, a hundred kilo fish that's good to eat is a hundred kilo fish that's good to eat. At all. <laughs> so, so thank you. My um, last question to you, Jerry. I actually got connected to you through a colleague at Island Innovation, um, another Island Innovation ambassador, which is a global yeah. network of people who do sustainability work in islands with over 300 ambassadors. You are also part of many international organizations such as the Global Shapers. And how does being part of such organizations help you for what you're doing in your local community? I would say first, first among the things that you know have given me a broader perspective is the exposure I've gotten from you know these these platforms, the, the global shapers under the web, as well as um, being part of the Mandela Washington Fellowship funded by the US as well. It gave, me a, it gave me an opportunity to be in US for a couple of weeks to understand how community work is done there. Two opportunities um, are, are, are still giving me and that gave me a bigger perspective on you know how the world is out there, how different people are doing their approaches there, but also you know a wider network of people that I can talk to people that are, you know, they can understand what are the issues that I'm, I'm speaking. People can give me ideas and exchange of knowledge to, and, you know, and technology towards bringing sustainable communities. And uh, the island ambassador of Island Innovation, you know, the way we met is, was all around, um, around the, the seaweed thing. You know, we were just having a chat with a friend and, and he said that, you know, I, I know a woman who's thinking about sustainability and you know, I think you guys can talk. And then when we started to talk, and we just saw like you know, there's a lot of connectivity between us on sustainable projects, and you know how the world could be a better place without changing so much as what people think. And, and in that way, I'm I'm so glad of the exposure, the network that I'm getting from these platforms, but also uh, more most importantly, you know, the love I feel in in, in these in these communities. It's it's far beyond normal. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. I, I myself as well, I think just the exchange and hearing what other people are doing and seeing all the great work is, is really exciting and also very motivating and, and helping with a lot of issues and problems and yeah, helping each other, making even stronger things together. Yeah, well, well, Asante san. Yes, or, uh, Asante san, that's the correct Asante -san. Asante, yes, it's, it's, yeah. it's been a while, it's been a while. Yeah, I get it. Um, yeah, but thank you so much for being here today. I, I, we, we appreciate your presence. And, and for me, I, I hope that we'll, I'll, I'll be in contact with you and, and see if there's something you and I can do with, with Marine Conservation Without Borders, maybe create some nice yeah. materials for you guys and, and see what we can yeah. do. But um, in the meantime, please greet your family for me and, and your colleagues and, and tell them I'll be thinking about them as I, I try to process some stuff that we can work together and I, uh, that I tell them I look forward to working with them all. Thank you so much. Just one thing for, for everyone who's listening to the podcast, um, 
Um, my interest around Saga Sam right now is, you know, far beyond, and I really want to understand what's happening, what's happened, and there's a lot of questions that we're supposed to answer in Zanzibar and Tanzania. So people are thinking around research to answer these questions. I really welcome them to partner with me through my organization, with me through the university, and we'll be happy to collaborate and answer these questions which are very important for the time being. Yeah, I think that's so important, like that we start doing research where you are, so that if it becomes a big problem, that you are already a step ahead and Definitely. don't have the huge problem that happened in the Caribbean, who got completely taken by surprise by the amount of sargassum that arrived. Not, not due to their fault, it was just a lot of sargassum from nowhere, so everybody would be surprised. Actually, you also give us for sure the the idea or the dream maybe to go or come back for, for this land, to this land. It looked really, really beautiful. And I'm so curious to discover this uh, IG culture, you know, uh, what you said, because there is three yeah. things important, like fishing, the aquaculture of IG and, uh, and the tourism. So it's really powerful in your place. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, Cleo. Thank you, Jerry. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for, I mean, it's, it's been great talking to you. I think that I've maybe a little bit more too enthusiastic. No, thank you. Some of those questions that I had for you are questions that have been burning inside of me for years and all. Yeah, and I was, I was very happy to be able to talk to somebody that, that at least felt like they knew some of the answers. So thank you so much for being here today. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good good evening and good morning in different places. Wow. It, it feels like I actually visited Tanzania and got to see the reefs and the farms and the fishermen. The way he described how people are doing stuff, I could actually picture it and, and make myself a really good picture and idea of what, what stuff is like there. I think that was that was really cool. Yeah, exactly. By your story, also, Ruby, you help us to project ourselves in this place that is totally new for me. I mean, about from having heard of it, but I really love this interview. So I think we have to go there when one day when it's possible <laughs> to travel that far. Yeah, well, I certainly enjoyed myself today, and all. And um, you know, I I could I could taste the Mendoza in the Ugali again. And uh, it was good. And, and I think you can tell by some of my questions, those are things I've been thinking about for a long time. So yeah, it was, it was good to be with somebody that was familiar with uh, the things I wanted to know. That, that's been a part of me for so long. And uh, it, it was just a great day today. I keep saying this, but this is probably my favorite interview we've done so far. But, but I, have a, I, have, I have my roots in East Africa. So it's, it was different to me. And this one touched a place in my heart that the other interviews have not. And also, I hope that, as you say, uh, Francisca, that at some point people will help the research there, so we we would get to know better about sargassum because it's totally unknown, at least for us, for the Caribbean. So we could, yeah, work all together on this topic because it's important and share share information uh, about what is good, what is not good, uh, what is, could be dangerous, what would, could be benefit uh, benefits. So. It, it's really important, I think, uh, and yeah. I hope that uh, many people would learn more about it through this interview. And I mean, he, he tried to figure out or find out what species are actually getting on the beach, and he found no information about that. Like, there's really so, from like a biological or research perspective, there's so much missing, and getting that just the basic information could give us a lot of ideas of what ha what's working because the local people they have done their research on what to do like he talked about the fishermen and how they are adapting to to being able to fish even when the sargassum is around he talked about the people with the, the seaweed farms and how they are adapting to to still do what they do he talked about the local women who found out that this is helping chicken pox and at the same time, if we knew what species of sargassum it is, we could we could do some studies about the chicken pox part and maybe help people make medicine for it or even use the knowledge these women have 
and maybe even find out stuff about the sargassum in the Caribbean that, that could be helpful. Well, or, or build on the knowledge they have and certainly give them exactly. credit for it. For, for all you master's students and PhDs looking for a PhD dissertation or a postdoc, we're discussing it right now. Get in touch with us and we'll, we'll, we'll put you in contact with somebody that can uh, send you upon your way. Yeah, and I, I definitely hope, it seems like at the moment, the local community can deal well with how much sargassum they're getting. The people who are impacted most of the time, except maybe for um, the tourism industry a bit less, have found ways around it. And then they're actually using the sargassum for the chicken pox and for beach nourishment. So in some ways, it's also a positive thing for them. But I really hope they don't get the situation that the Caribbean and West Africa have been experiencing. Because if it's overwhelming amount, maybe they would also need a lot of help. But if they do, I hope that the knowledge we have from the Caribbean can translate over and that we we are there's an, there's companies who are working in the Caribbean who will then help Tanzania and Zanzibar to, to deal with their problems too. Excellent. Excellent. Well look here guys. Uh, appreciate y'all being here. If all of you out there listening, watching or whatever, uh, you could have been any place else on the planet today, but you were here with us and and we appreciate you. And I uh, and, uh, hope you'll uh, like and share our stuff, let, it, let your friends know what we're doing and, uh, and, and help us spread the word because we got different, we got knowledge we need to share with everybody and, and you're a part of this. So thank you very much. Y'all have a wonderful, wonderful day. Hey, thanks for tuning in today and learning with us from our guest. If you want more information about what our guests talked about today, then, then check with our uh, show notes and links and information in our archives below. And don't forget to like and share our podcast with your friends. If you enjoyed our podcast, then please consider supporting us financially by becoming a Patreon. For as little as a dollar per month, you can support us and take part in an exclusive monthly Zoom meet and greet for Patreons, where you can network with our podcast guests and other sargassum enthusiasts. The Sargassum Podcast is produced by Marine Conservation Without Borders and is made possible with financial support from the Kimberly Green Latin American and Caribbean Centers, U.S. Department of Education, Title VI grant. It is produced by Marcel van de Kamp and Francisca Elmer, and your hosts today were Robbie Tickpen, Francisca Elmer, and Mark Fernandez. We will be back next week with another exciting guest. The music of this podcast is from the song Dem a Pray by Drizzle Road Rana an artist from Ruatan. Follow him on Spotify or YouTube for more music. But for now, here is the full song, Tem A Pray. Hey, brother. Hear me now. Brother, dog. Now me understand. Now for them no one be see we get nothing. That's why they my pray and no this front and star. Now for them no one be see we get nothing. That's why they my pray. Now for them a pray, them a pray, me no gain progress. Now for them a pray, them a pray, me no gain success. Now for them a pray, them a pray, them a pray, me no gain progress. Now for them a pray, them a pray, me no gain success. So me tell them ya, my business come and me no take that. Only if it come from ya, I'll accept that. Now for them me put me trust in a give me setback. Yo, select that, me lam pull up that Tell some wicked a bad mind, me no fear them Anytime them cheat and chat, me no hear them Me dash a few hearts, so go the queer them Me dash a few hearts, so tell them where them Now for them a free Them a free, me no gain progress Now for them a free Them a free, me no grip success So me tell them yeah Yes, me know me have a lot of fake friends But me never would have top, me would have have fake family yeah, So me tell them straight, me no trust them Me no trust you and me no trust him Fake friend lost, lost bad mind, mind in a real life Star, me no rate that, star, me no rate that Me real for me what that Bust a million shot in a real life real, real, real Now for them a free Them a free, me no gain progress Now for them a free 
them a pray me the great success Now for them a pray Them a pray me no gain progress Now for them a pray Them a pray me the great success So me tell them yeah. Like, but them a hate and grudge and creep on mine Them a move like Judas Them a move like Judas Plus, everybody have a life to live So they give one rash clock to a try judge me Let them chit and chat to what them want to say Cause none of them out there not feed me Them a them a free Them a free me no in progress Not for them a free Them a free me to rape success Now for them